the Ross Art Museum at Ohio Wesleyan University in an exhibition called Paul Henri Bourguignon uh, Recurring Themes. It's an exhibition that encompasses four decades of work by an artist who was born in Europe and spent the last years of his life in the United States. And I'm sitting here with his widow, Erica Bourguignon, and we're going to talk a little bit about his work. Can you begin by talking a little bit about Paul's background and how he got started as an artist? Yes, uh, Paul was born in Brussels in 1906 in Belgium. And he began as an artist, uh, as an art student, an art, artist as a young man at uh, probably about the age of 17. He worked with a teacher with whom he traveled across uh, Belgium, uh, particularly to the art cities like Bruges and Gand and so on. And he worked in pastel. Uh, but not in pastel as we think of it as flowers and pretty children, but uh, as a landscape painter uh, carrying his material along uh, and gaining a considerable amount of proficiency. And then he began to travel more widely to first to Paris and then the south of France uh, to what were then really exotic places like Corsica and Spain and Bosnia. Yugoslavia. Uh, well, Bosnia, of course, was part of, of Yugoslavia, but also to Serbia. And he was very much impressed, particularly by going to places like Yugoslavia, where he could read the signs because he couldn't read Cyrillic alphabet and he couldn't understand the language and he thought that was absolutely wonderful being in a strange exotic place uh, but he had a very sobering experience and that is that he sitting on a, a terrace of a cafe and uh, uh, he got to talking with a young man of about the same age uh, who knew some French and who said, ah, how wonderful it must be to be in an exotic place like Brussels, not like uh, what we have here, always the same thing. <laughs> and, and, uh, so there are, wherever um, you are at home, it may just seem too familiar and too dull and places that are different suggest other opportunities but they may not be quite as exotic to the people who live there. But for the rest of his life, at least on and off, Paul seemed to really make an effort to plunge himself into other circumstances, other places, other environments. And after studying as an artist in uh, Brussels and, and working in Belgium for a while, after the war he spent time in Haiti, where you two met, That's right. and That's in right. Peru, and then ended up in Columbus, in Columbus Ohio. Ohio. And so this exhibition, although most of the works in it were done in Columbus, all of them, all all of of them, them. were done in Columbus, they encompass his experiences and his memories and his thoughts of all of those places. That's quite true, that's quite true. And I should add, of course, in addition to the, the experience, visual experiences, there was his study of art history and his uh, just study of, of literature. And Brussels is a city full of art. You don't have to particularly go to a museum. You don't even have to go into a church. You might just look at a church from the outside. Uh -huh. And the place is, is full of history, full of art, and memories of famous artists, Virgil and so on. Um, and that, I said, you will see all of that uh, really reworked, reprocessed uh, in what we have in this gallery. And in fact, when we were thinking about the title of the show and the work for the show and the sort of the recurring themes of the show, uh, one of them is about how Paul always drew on 
his experience, his education. We talked about one theme being sort of uh, Paul as the observer and how his observation was always filtered through his uh, travels, but also through his studies, his cultural awareness of the world as a whole. That's right. And uh, we've got a perfect example um, that we're sitting right by, which is this triptych of donor figures with the image of the city of Toledo in France. And in Spain. In Spain, excuse me, gosh. <laughs> Toledo, Spain. And Paul had written his dissertation on El Greco, That's who correct. did several very, very famous paintings of Toledo. And one of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. York uh -huh. And so this is, in a sense, building on that. But it also, to me, I look at it and I see Cezanne and Cezanne's admonition to artists to see the world in terms of cubes and squares and uh, it's a very sort of cubic or fauvist feel to the simplification of the landscape. Yeah, I see a number of things here in the, or, or at least one thing beyond what, what you were saying and that is the reflection of these houses in, in the waters of the river because I recall Paul telling me how he spent time in Bruges and Belgium sitting at a canal staring at the water and moving, looking at the reflections in the water. So many, many years later, that, that scene of reflection in the water comes back. <clears throat> we might take a look at the other versions, the earlier versions of Toledo, that act uh, really f as preparations for this. But in this case, you have it framed or linked to uh, the image of donors uh, the, the King um, Ferdinand and Isabella, in this case, with their prayer books, and uh, in which there is actually a signature and, uh, and, the date I, the and the date in both of these cases. Now, that, of course, is an allusion to altar pieces that you might see in, in uh, churches in, in Belgium. There is uh, one other point about this, or maybe a couple. One of them is that the, at least the heads of these figures are identical drawings, and uh, they do not look at the center, which you would have in a in a church painting, but they look at the at the viewer, and will follow you around. And uh, one other little detail, and that is that the head is, in fact, a simplified self-portrait. Um, but they, they're essentially identical, the two, that he has then just used very, very subtle changes to suggest the female figure and the male that's, figure. That's correct. Um, which is part of that sort of interest in the simplicity and sort of the essence of the image is also comes through in the way he's looking at the landscape, which is very much in the tradition of European modernism. Um, Whereas this has a sort of a folk art scene, and if you look behind you then, uh, this painting of uh, what he called mean? Andean women, uh -huh. which comes from his uh, experience in Peru, of course, uh, this uh, has some of the same tradition of the folk art. Exactly, and when you look at this all together, and why I was saying I think this is such an example of all the fusions and synthesis that we are talking about, is that it's a Euro it's an image of a city in Spain, you know, that he would know not only through observation but through famous art, then fused with his memories of Bruges and the reflections of the water, his memories of Peru and the people of Peru and the folk art of Peru. Um, so it's an old world scene, it's a new world scene, it's a scene that's based on memory and culture and education and observation all rolled up into one. Absolutely. And a little bit of a joke through all of that too, and I think that that's sort of... you look at these two figures of the donors, they are really quite humorous. Uh, we once had a student living with us, and he discovered that there was a painting in his room, 
and he came out in the morning very disturbed. He had thought that the painting was humorous, but he didn't know that art could be fun. And so he was wondering whether it was all right to laugh or whether he had missed something. And I think that, that, that that's, again, says a lot. I think that's um, actually, there are a lot of works in this show that make you smile or laugh on, on some level, partly just through Paul's delight in what he was doing. Absolutely. Speaking of, of figures and humor, uh, this is a pair of uh, faces uh, that uh, are labeled or are identified as Don Quixote and Dulcinea. And that brings you a different sort of relationship than we saw in among the donors, but it is again a relationship. Uh, he at least is very much interested in her, she is a little less interested, which reflects the storyline. So here you have uh, the painter going back to Spain uh, to uh, rather simplified uh, facial representations with an emphasis on eyes, uh, among other things, and uh, with a sense of humor, and memory in this case not of a scene, but of a character in literature, uh, which is entirely relevant again to Spain and Peru, and simplification and whimsy and portraiture and, and all of these things. These are two very different paintings of Haiti. Uh, this, uh, the first one is very much uh, emphasizes bright colors and uh, the structure to, that suggests Haiti most typically are these tall palm trees. Um, it's sunlight that really bleaches out um, objects and reality and emphasizes uh, color and movement. The other one is uh, a bit more static, but you again have uh, these very tall palm trees and a series of little houses and people. Uh, the Haitian landscapes very typically uh, show people. Many of the other landscapes really don't. There are no people in the Toledo landscape. There are no people in the various studies of Toledo and, and so on. So um, these, the other interesting thing about this Haitian painting is the sky actually isn't bright blue. The blue is the sea behind it. But the sky is dark because the, of the, uh, the way in which the sun shines uh, intensely. Uh, whereas the roofs, which are uh, sheet metal, reflect the sun. So there you have both reality and uh, the emphasis on certain kinds of features of the landscape. Sort of reality reduced to its essentials or concentrated in its essentials, which is something that we often talk about in um, Paul's really, really acute visual memory. And what he remembered was sort of the strongest sensations, the, the brilliant colors, the, the way the sun affected the colors, um, the way it it reflected off those, those metal roofs. This is a long way from uh, Toledo and uh, the Cezannean characteristic of, of landscape. And again, the, the start with a drawing and so on, but that you have an immediate uh, reflection of the, of the scene in his head on paper without really going through a process of uh, setting up a design and so on. We both have discovered that a lot of visitors to the show seem to gravitate towards this piece, um, which has the title, The Last Canvas. And we've both been sort of wondering uh, a little bit about why. And uh, do you want to talk about that just a little bit? Yes, it's a, a painting from the early 50s. Uh, it's a gouache, uh, 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 and it is a strikingly 
impressionistic kind of uh, landscape, the rather classic theme of uh, a large haystack. Uh, and then there's a, a little painter and he's easel, he's even looking away from uh, the um, easel. The interesting thing is that when the impressionists began to paint this way, uh, they were received with horror and shock. It was oversimplified, it wasn't refined enough, and so on. And that now, more than a hundred years later, is seen as comfortable, familiar uh -huh. landscape art. And, and Paul was actually maybe almost commenting a little bit on the Impressionists That's right, in, because in this painting. This is the way he was trained, of course, uh, in the uh, 1920s. To work outside. To work outside, uh, and he had a story of how he had uh, painted a um, house that uh, had white walls, and he thought yellow would look better, and his teacher was horrified. He had made a, a change in in the landscape, he hadn't reflected it correctly. So he was, I think, commenting, rejecting as uh, outmoded um, a particular way of working. But the other thing that's kind of fun is the, the figure, again, just by capturing very, very simple, concise means, kind of an awkward pose in the painter. That's right. And I think it, it maybe captures both the sense of anticipation and um, uh, anxiety that artists often feel when confronting um, both subjects and blank canvases. Absolutely. And I think that might also be sort of part of the joke that he's pointing out and the, the fun that he's having with the yes. subject. Yes, I think so. Uh, Paul painted a, a lot of heads and a lot of figures, but how he painted them really began to change over the years. And here you see a, a head of a, a young man, uh, dated about 1980, uh, but on top of the, the paint, you have a white outline. But the white outline doesn't exactly follow the face. The white outline suggests a somewhat different face so that if you look straight at it, you see a profile. If you look more carefully, you see a three-quarter. But if you move along, you will see that there are in fact two eyes and you have a full face. So you can make this head turn whichever way you as the viewer would like to. In the next painting, you actually have something even more strongly emphasizing the, the white lines because you don't have a figure in the um, colors. The figure is entirely imposed by the white lines. This is the first painting in the show and it's one of many modernist interpretations of a woman with a rather interesting hat. Uh, that's right, but it comes out of uh, a European tradition, it's one of the early paintings that Paul did in Columbus. And as the years went by, uh, his manner of approaching uh, faces and, and figures uh, changed. And you can see that as we move along here to uh, a painting of just a few years later, which is uh, considerably simplified and much emphasizes a different kind of expression on the face. And uh, the third one here is uh, something of a self-portrait, uh, although not uh, admitted as such, uh, but again in, um, influenced very heavily by uh, classic uh, art. Classic. Both classic art and, and modernist art, and because modernist you can art. see both sort of the the El Grecos, but also the Picassos and Matisses and Modigliani's and uh, the European modernists that Paul's studies would have been really steeped in. That's that's absolutely correct. Now, as we then move uh, again into a much more uh, later period of his life we find a, a 
totally different approach, and yet he never wanted to be an abstract artist, as you know. He wanted, he talked about transposition, but that there was always a human uh, experiential dimension to his work, and not simply uh, an arrangement of forms. These are, this is an acrylic on a paper, and it um, involves the use of a variety of, of tools, I would say. Uh, and you can see that there are layers upon layers of paint, uh, and the figure is quite schematic, but it has the essence of, of Don Quixote. It has the spear and the, the wash basin that turns into a, a helmet, and, uh, and the eye and the eagerness and so on, and, and the, the strength of, uh, I'm tempted to say that the strength comes out of the colors uh, the red, the yellow, the pierce, the black, uh, and, and so on. It's a, it is a very schematic, it's very dynamic, and it, is, it speaks to you really quite, quite directly. And the figure is very much um, emerging from the ground. Um, you've told me before that in these later works, Paul used all kinds of different painting tools. He used sponges and spatulas, and kitchen implements and well, you printed on and, and, and very vigorous kind of painting and would lay in the ground of the painting and then let the fig you know it's almost like you would discover what figure wanted to come out of it absolutely absolutely and you see that even more so in another one that we'll see right here um, in this case you have a something he did actually quite often, and that is to have cover uh, an area with a pattern uh, and using bright colors and again various kinds of uh, gadgets and so on, and then extracting this figure uh, from uh, the larger area by using a spatula, using in this case uh, darker colors, but you can see that the pattern itself uh, is underlies this darker color and it uh, pierces through. But what you end up with is a woman's head and bust and a rather long neck. But if you if it weren't hanging on a wall, if you didn't have a signature, you could turn it upside down, and you'd have another lady. So in this case, this is. Uh, this is part of her body, but you can imagine this is part of the head, too. So that there is, a, as you said, a figure that wants to come out. You're reminded of uh, Michelangelo's uh, line about how the figure is in the marble and he removes the excess and the figure emerges. Uh, in this case, you have a, a large pattern, and there is, in fact, an embedded figure here if you look at it hard enough. But what is particularly interesting to me is something that I know he struggled with and talked about, and he really didn't talk much about his work, and that is that the light comes through from behind the painting. It isn't light fr on the, coming from the front, but coming from the back, like as in a stained glass window in a church. And that's actually something that you can see in a number of these later works um, with the way the color is, is layered. It really is if they're radiating out and you can see them behind. This, he actually labeled some of, uh, of these more abstract seeming forms. Uh, he, uh, he called it Japanese ju jugglers. And um, again, you see this pattern and the, um, the dark background is in fact a foreground, right? Uh -huh. And the light comes through and the light comes to form the figures. And you can see their movements on the, the balls that they juggle and, and so on. In a, in a sense, the, the whimsy, his sort of appreciation of humor and whimsy comes that he would make a 
see what figures em emerged, but then also sort of just see what they suggested to him and then pull out that suggestion. Th that's right. In other words, he didn't say, I will go and paint Japanese jugglers. But when he had it, he said, ah, that's what they are. <laughs> <laughs>